If there is no God, what's real? Matter and energy. Obviously, this is real, these bricks. Obviously, this, this, energy is real. But if there is no God, that's all of reality. Matter and energy. How literally should we interpret the Bible? Like, did Jonah actually get eaten by a whale? You know, like that kind of thing? You or, bet. You know, how, like, are there levels to how we should read these passages? You know what I mean? Very good question. Sir, to be honest with you, I read everything literally. What does that mean? You literally read it? I guess. Yes, but to read something literally means to respect the literary style. I read a poem literally as a poem. I read a biology textbook, literally as a science textbook. I read a history book, literally as an eyewitness account or an, written by people who knew the eyewitnesses about historical events. If you don't learn to respect literary style, you're not gonna be very educated. So you've gotta respect literary style. And I read everything literally, which means, first of all, I figure out, is this a poem? Is this a fairy tale? Is this historical narrative? Is this a science textbook? Second point, I read everything literally. What does that mean? It means I don't rip one line out of Macbeth and say, oh, this is Shakespeare's view of the world. No, you read in context, and you got to do the same with the Bible. You don't rip one line out of the Bible and say, that's the point of the Bible. When Jesus says in Luke 14, I tell you the truth, unless you hate your father and mother, your wife and children, you cannot be my disciple. It is a misinterpretation to say, Jesus is literally saying, hate mom and dad and hate your siblings. It's not what he's saying. But in order to understand that, you have to read in context. So I would encourage you, read everything literally. Meaning by that, not when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world that he's claiming to be a 100-watt light bulb. No, he's not claiming to be a 100-watt light bulb when he says, I'm the light of the world. He's using it symbolically, metaphorically, to point out, if you want to understand direction in life, if you want to understand purpose, follow me. So what would you say to a non-believer who tries to discredit the Bible based off the idea of like young earth versus old earth? Kind of the science behind that. You bet. Someone who says to me, the reason I can't believe the Bible is because science tells me the earth is about five billion years old. And the Bible tells me that the earth is about four to 8,000 years old. Just shoot back with a question. Really, would you please show me in the Bible where the Bible says the earth is four to 8,000 years old? I mean, I've read the Bible an awful lot. I'm 68 years old. I've been reading the thing for over 50 years and never once. Have I read where the Bible says the earth is this many years old? So you see, sir, from the Bible, I don't know how old the earth is because the Bible never answers the question. Now, if I want to find out how old the earth is, I turn to science. I don't turn to the Bible. The same way, if I want to learn about photosynthesis in this tree, I don't read the Bible. The Bible does not give me a biological description of photosynthesis. Oh, well, that means the Bible's not reliable. Excuse me? What good biology textbook tells you the history of the United States? Just because a biology textbook is silent about the history of the United States says nothing about whether it's valid biologically. Just because a history book doesn't answer the question, how do the stars revolve? Doesn't mean that the history book is invalid. See, that is why it's so important to understand different literary styles and then respect that. Does the Bible say you're to be a Republican? Thank you. Does the Bible say you're supposed to be a Democrat? Does the Bible say you're supposed to be American? Was Jesus an American? No. And we had a wonderful gentleman out here from Nigeria who pointed out to a white woman who was basically throwing out the typical anthropology professor's line that, oh, those Africans believe in Jesus because white missionaries came and told them. 
and they shoved Jesus down their throat. And this beautiful, wonderful gentleman from Nigeria said, excuse me, I'm from Nigeria, I grew up in Nigeria, and guess what? Our church in Africa, especially in Ethiopia, is far older than any church or denomination in England or France. Why? Because he knows Acts chapter 8, where Philip talks with an Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch is going back to Ethiopia, and right there, Philip leads him to Christ. So if anybody thinks that faith in Christ is a white person's religion, they're out of touch with reality. It is not. Thank you, sir, for raising that thoughtful question. I hear a lot of the times that Christians are uh, hypocrites. Yep. Because they don't practice what they preach. How do you respond to that? Good question. All right. I live an hour north of New York City. We were just beginning our church that we began 21 years ago, 22 years ago now, on September 1st. 2001. Ten days later, some Muslim fanatics flew two jetliners into the World Trade Center in New York City. If you ask me, Cliff, what do you think about Islam? If I say to you, 9-11 tells me everything I need to know about Islam. What am I? A bigot. Exactly right. I am a hypocritical bigot. If you ask me, hey man, what do you think about Islam? And I say, all I need to know about Islam is 9-11. I have to have the open-mindedness to read the Quran, to find out what did Muhammad teach? How did Muhammad treat people? I cannot allow some fanatical Muslims who fly jet airliners into the World Trade Center to be my primary source of information about Muhammad. Well, sir, the same thing is true of Jesus Christ. To be open-minded means I don't allow some hypocritical Christian to turn me off to Jesus Christ. They're a hypocrite. Why would I trust them to give me an accurate picture of Jesus? Instead, I must go to the source documents written by the eyewitnesses and those who knew the eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I must study the historical record of Jesus. And then based on the evidence, I will either reject him as a fraud or I will put my faith in him as the truth. And guess what? I got to do the same thing with Muhammad and the Quran. I got to read the Quran if I'm serious to considering Muhammad and find out how did Muhammad live? What did he teach? How did he treat people? How did he die? And did anything happen after his death? And I can promise you, sir, the grave of Muhammad is full. The grave of Jesus Christ is empty. It's his historical resurrection from the dead that sets Christ apart as unique, as different. And that is why faith in Christ is not, I believe, I believe, I believe. No. Faith in Christ is not blind faith. Faith in Christ is based on evidence, not proof. Can't prove anything. A lot of unanswered questions in my faith in Christ. But it is based on solid evidence that Christ is reliable. And that's why I'm a Christian. Because the evidence is Christ is far more reliable than I am. That's for sure. But I also notice Christ is more reliable than any of the alternatives. Be it philosophers, politicians, religious leaders. He's far more reliable. Stuart, how do you think of the issue of hypocrisy? Well... It's the church is so interesting because it is self critiquing when it comes to hypocrisy. And what I mean by that is automatically when somebody steps out in such a way where they're living completely against the rules of Christ and what he teaches us. Well, the church has already set those rules in place. Now, all of a sudden, when you have somebody who's critiquing Christians, where are they getting that moral standard from? 99% chance they're getting it from Christ. This is a Judeo-Christian country that we grew up in that sprouted years ago. And so I think it's so hilarious when somebody is saying, oh, you Christian, you don't live for justice. Oh, you Christian, you don't live for human rights. Oh, you Christian, you slander and gossip. Okay, well, where are you getting that standard 
as, say, an atheist to critique the church. So the, the church critiques itself in terms of understanding that standard and saying, wow, we are hi- living hypocritical lives. But then also the one who's critiquing, it's, it's like a goldfish. I, I, I think that person literally is a goldfish swimming in a large ocean, turns to his grandpa, you've all probably heard the analogy before, and said, what is water? That's well, just like that atheist in a Judeo-Christian culture. What is water? I have no idea the culture I'm swimming in. So when I go after you and say that you're living a very hypocritical life where you're not living for goodness, but you're living in an evil kind of mundacious sort of way, <laughs> well, where are you getting the standard to critique that person? How are you saying he or she is being hypocritical? And so, so many people don't catch that in themselves and don't understand just the root of why and how they're going after, say, a Christian and saying, you're a hypocrite in your lifestyle. If Christ's tomb is empty and Muhammad is not, well, there's there's something to be said for that. Um, One of the readings at Mass in the Gospel was uh, after the resurrection, um, the guards of the tomb go to the high priests and explain what's happened. And the Jewish high priests say, we'll take care of everything, take this money, go and tell the Romans and the people that his followers stole him away, uh, that they took the body and that they've hidden it somewhere. Uh, and it says at the end of that reading that this rumor has pervaded or has you know, spread amongst the Jews and the Romans till this day, which that day, I guess, refers to whenever that particular gospel is written. Um, but how would you respond? I haven't heard that argument like, I don't hear that in modern times personally very often. Those conversations don't generally get to that point. I've heard different arguments first and foremost, but it still is an argument that could be made. How, how do you respond to the idea that like maybe Mary and John and Peter and James just went and yoinked Christ's body and buried him in some unmarked grave and said, look, he's gone, he's gone, he's risen, he's risen. Good. Stuart? Firstly, they would have had no reason to have done that. It would have gone against their whole worldview when it comes to being Jews. Judaism would say there's a general resurrection at the end of time. There is nothing about a suffering servant, they would believe. We believe that out of Isaiah 53, that it was a man, right? Jesus Christ. But they never would have said a Messiah figure would suffer on a cross, die, and be resurrected individually. That's the reversal. See, we live in a scientific age where people think, oh, we're just growing in our scientific understanding, so let's just push the supernatural away, especially when it comes to something like the resurrection. We do not realize that Jews in that day would have had more hoops to have jumped through in believing something like a single Messiah having lived, died in total weakness and having been resurrected in a singular sort of way, rather generally. That was a ju- It was embarrassing. That would have been completely offensive. And so in this chronological snobbery that we have, we think, oh, those poor idiots, they just thought resurrection was possible. No, you have Joseph, who was privately, quietly going to divorce his wife Mary because he knew how babies happen. It's not just a mixing of the earwax that somehow she and another man somehow mixed earwax. No, he knows it's sex. (laughs) So he's not an idiot. It's chronological snobbery to say, oh, they just have no idea, you know, resurrections just happened and they just figured... What you bring up, though, is a fascinating point because that's actually a piece of evidence, big piece of evidence, for the resurrection because it's called enemy attestation, which is saying, yes, we better do something about this. It's not just Christians making this up and saying, oh, I witnessed testimony and we saw Jesus and he was walking through walls but also eating fish. No, it's enemy attestation saying we better spread a rumor or people are going to actually believe this. And so Mary and the others would not have made that up. That would have been the last thing they would have made up in terms of a story. Secondly, he was buried in the well-known tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a top dog in the Sanhedrin. So it would have been a clear marking where that grave was. He wouldn't have just been tossed in with other criminals to some type of mass grave. Evidence doesn't show that at all. It's a great question. End of my thinking on what Stuart just shared is, Peter and Paul died martyrs' deaths. Thomas died in South India, probably. Matthew was probably martyred. John went through a very difficult time on the Isle of Patmos. So these guys who claimed to have seen Jesus risen from the dead were willing to die for what they had seen. They were not dying for a belief. They were not dying for faith. They were not dying for a philosophy. They were dying for what they claimed to have seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. It is impossible 
to convince me, because I've studied the psychology of it, that people will die to cover up what they know is a lie. Will people die for a lie? Of course they will. But they'll die believing in the lie. But you see, what you've got with these first century followers of Christ is, over 500 of them saw Christ risen from the dead. And they were willing to die, not for religion, not for faith, not for a philosophy, not for a political position. They were willing to die for what they claimed to have seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. Now, one of my heroes in the faith is a guy named Chuck Colson, who served under Richard Nixon in the Watergate years. And Chuck Colson watched some of the most brilliant American lawyers named Dean Ehrlichman maintain the Watergate lie until, until the court pressure came which said, you're going to go to prison for what you guys supported. And they said, oh, sorry, a lie, a cover-up, so sorry. And Colson's point was, when you watch brilliant American lawyers lie, and then under the threat of some penalty, like prison, cave in, you can't convince me that these first century Palestinian Jews who claimed to have seen Jesus risen from the dead were willing to die unless they had really seen him. Do you believe that good and evil can exist without the presence of God or no? And if so, why exactly? When we think of good and evil, we, automatically our mind should go to religion. That's why when you see, even at mass shootings, typically, I've read in the New York Times and many articles before, where it'll talk about, even secular sources saying, people resist the term evil because they now look at it in a very religious kind of way because they understand evil points to something like God because if there's evil, there's goodness. And so I, w whenever I talk to secular folks, they have a almost impossible time explaining evil. They'll, they'll try and say something bad. They'll, they'll categorize as, you know, it's, it's bad. It's bad for humankind. But evil, now you're ushering in a transcendent source that's connected to objective morality saying that this is evil, this is horrible for all people at all time. I think of Hannibal Lecter out of Silence of the Lambs, right? Is that the name of the movie? Yeah. And when Officer Starling comes in and he's in the cage, right? And she says, what in the world happened to you? And basically what she's starting to get at is, was it behaviorism? Was it your parents? Is it your mental health? What is it? And he looked at her and said, you just can't handle that I'm evil, that I have evil within me. You want to somehow make a base assumption that it's just determined from my upbringing or my own neurochemicals in order to make yourself feel better. Because you, then you can pinpoint and say, this is why he was a serial killer. Rather than evil, which is an immaterial source that ushers in typically a demonic force, as well as a heavenly source like God. And she struggles with that, and he pinpoints it beautifully in that illustration by saying, you can't work through that from a materialistic point of view. You can't grab hold of it and say, this is how we gotta fix it, because you don't know how to fix it without goodness, a God, and without, say, a satanic force, evil. So Saul used to murder Christians and all that, and then he was blinded, and then he got restored of his blindness, and he started preaching the gospel. So do you think Christians nowadays have to go through such a dramatic experience, like fully true, like fully follow God, or fully like preach the gospel or anything? Okay, good question. Stuart, what do you think? Well, so when I first decided to become a pastor, I remember I had a few people say, oh, that's a calling. And they weren't referencing themselves in different areas of work as they had a calling, mm -hmm. right? And so oftentimes it gets put on pastors, spiritual leaders, you know, elders in a church. To, they're just the only ones to do ministry and preach the gospel. Okay. But the definition of calling came out of the 1800s, which was everybody, I mean, hopefully everybody was going to be Christian, right? That, that was the idea. Obviously our nation was much more Christian during that time period, was to have a calling. And the definition of a calling was to preach the news to understand to believe in God 
and to serve community. So basically the first commandment, right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So in that sense, we were all to share the gospel and to have a strong relationship with God. Now, it's going to look differently, obviously, in terms of how much time is spent with what career you have, because Paul himself was a tent maker. And so early on, it looked very different for him in terms of how much he shared. So no, I wouldn't put a number on it in terms of hours spent doing it. But remember this, Christians have always been called the preachy ones. The preachy word came out of this desire to insult Christians. You're being preachy by trying to convert us or proselytize. Okay, Christians are less preachy, I think, than just about any other group espousing any other philosophy today. Christians are insular. We're not really sharing much. Every other group, whether it's political or secular, to me, they sound so much preachier than we are today, it's scary. So, last point would be Christians need to share their faith loudly, more overtly, now more so than ever, as this is becoming a more secular country. And don't allow anybody to say, oh, you're just trying to convert me. You're just proselytizing. Everybody proselytizes, even by them saying that, because by them saying that, they're saying, oh, I have a better definition and understanding of what spirituality is or what communication is than you. Do you see that? Yeah. As them silencing you, that's a type of proselytizing. Because they want to define it as, well, whoever's louder. Well, okay, they could be louder at the time, or you could be. So Christians back themselves into a corner because they're nervous about this preachy word or proselytization. But everybody evangelizes just in different ways. For me, I was just thinking about this issue. How many people walk around here like this? And if you think that the, what they're watching here isn't an attempt to get their attention, to get their time, and often to get their money, you are naive. This little device called an iPhone is incredible and it's competing for your attention. And so yes, Jesus Christ is competing for our attention. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Yes, Jesus is calling us to himself to learn to trust in him. And so are a lot of folks coming through that iPhone. And if anybody thinks that this is a totally neutral device and that there is no agenda behind what's being promoted on an iPhone, you are naive. They are out for your time, your attention, and most of them are out for your money. Are good works essential to reach the kingdom of heaven? I've heard a lot of debate on it. Mm -hmm. I myself, I, I can't come to a conclusion. You bet. Stuart, are good works a way to salvation? Well, that's why you have the beautiful combination of Paul and James. Paul talks a lot about grace. James talks a lot about who are the people you're hanging out with. Uh, are they helping you do good works? Be careful with the company that you keep. So the beautiful blendedness of Paul and James gives us an understanding. It's grace that we're saved by. But then if you go out with the Kira Knightley syllogism of, oh, you Christians, it's so easy. You just got to, you know, once you do something bad, just ask for forgiveness and you're going to heaven. No, obviously not. Paul, Paul, as well as James, talks about the importance of not grieving the Holy Spirit, the importance of sanctification and growing in your faith. Jesus talks about those who will be in the lake of fire, the slanderers, the gossipers, those who are anxious. I find that pretty interesting because the anxiety is talking about those who basically have, have, have made an idol out of something that causes anxiety, which is other than God. It's a separation from God. So you have Jesus Christ dying on the cross, saying you can't do it in and of yourself. But then he's talking about these whitewashed tombs, the Pharisees, who care way more so about what others think, what man thinks, than what God thinks. And they're just doing their own workspace righteousness. Because I, I personally believe that the Pharisees were probably tithing more than the majority of Christians in that day and age. They were just showing off. Are they going to be saved? It doesn't, certainly doesn't look like that to me in how Christ encounters them. So it's grace... But then also, you got a ton of language in there. Paul's viceless. 
where you're supposed to be growing in the faith in terms of understanding who Jesus is. So the workings of fruits of the spirit, the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Botanical growth, fruit. So you're saved by grace. Now it's the botanical growth of the, the fruit showing that, Christ, I really believe in you. I want to have a relationship with you. And I want to grow in a flourishing life, which is the good life. I respect Martin Luther, the great reformer, but I disagree with him in his view of the book of James. Martin Luther thought that James contradicted Paul, and he called James a right straw epistle. Didn't like it. I disagree with him. I think if you read the book of James carefully, you will notice he is not saying the way to heaven is by being a good person. Instead, he is saying there is such a thing as sincere faith and insincere faith. And it's real simple to distinguish between the two. Insincere faith shows itself in no change of lifestyle, no works. Sincere faith shows itself in a radical change of lifestyle, in a desire to obey Christ. James never says faith is not good. What he does say is faith without works is dead. Now, this is not that hard a concept. If I, if I say to you, hey man, I really love you, and then I haul back and slap you in the face, you know I'm playing games with your head. I don't really love you. If I loved you, I wouldn't have clocked you. Similarly with Christ. If I say, Lord Jesus, I love you, and I could really give a rip about how you tell me to live, I don't love Christ. I'm just playing a game, a head game. And that's a dangerous head game. It's called hypocrisy. And you know that a bunch of us at the University of South Carolina have a real problem with Christianity because of all them Christian hypocrites. Why? Because that emotionally hurts us. When someone says one thing and they contradict it with their lifestyle, that hurts us emotionally. It's like, you're not authentic. You're not sincere. You're a hypocrite. And if that's what a Christian is, I'm not interested. Okay, of course, the intellectual mistake there is you cannot give a Christian hypocrite the power to tune you off to the true Christ who did not have a hypocritical bone in his body, who taught an amazingly high ethical standard and then lived up to it perfectly. It's one of the reasons I trust Jesus, because he taught an amazingly high ethical standard and then he lived up to it. You talk about integrity, you talk about authenticity, you talk about sincerity, Christ had it. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church, located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.